Hi, my name is Colonel Brad Myers. I'm a traditional guardsman. During my day job, I work at SSM Health in Waterloo. I've been a family doctor for 35 years. Here at the Guard, I'm commander of the medical group. I'd like to tell you a little bit about coronavirus and COVID-19. This is a challenging time for us. This is the first time this country has seen a pandemic such as this since the 1918 influenza epidemic. So knowledge is power, and I think with knowledge comes some reduction in our fear and a better ability to cope with the situation that we're faced with currently. So first off, I'm going to tell you a little bit about coronavirus. Here you see a picture of the coronavirus. You see the little red kind of uh, bumps that are on the coronavirus? That's the corona, and that's how it's named, interestingly. Coronavirus is a real common infection. This one isn't. This is called novel coronavirus. Most of us have had a coronavirus infection sometimes in our life because coronavirus is one of the major causes of the common cold. This is not a common cold. We don't have immunity to it. It's a new virus. When we have a cold, and I often tell my patients that there are about 360 different cold viruses out there, and so whenever they have a cold, they're not going to get that same cold again because they have immunity. So you only have to have 360 colds and you're all done with it. But with a novel coronavirus, we don't have immunity because it's new. We now are taking great pains in Wisconsin to try and limit the spread of the virus, and that's why the governor has issued a stay-at-home order for people. Safer at home, he calls it. And it certainly is. If you look at the infection curves in areas that have issued stay-at-home orders, then because there's no contact with other people, the infection goes way down. Let's talk a little bit about what the coronavirus does. In other words, what your symptoms are. When you need to worry that you might have coronavirus. The symptoms are a cough, shortness of breath, and a fever with a temp above 100.4. Other symptoms, and these are fairly newly reported, just an article recently from ear, nose, and throat specialists around the country have indicated that a loss of the sense of taste and a loss of the sense of smell suddenly occurring can be an indicator of coronavirus infection. There are a couple of more symptoms you might be concerned about as being possible harbingers or indicators of coronavirus, and that's some GI symptoms. Now, I don't want people to confuse coronavirus or COVID-19, the disease process, with having just a GI bug. And if you have, you know, a little nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea for a day, that's just the 24-hour bug that we all get. But nonetheless, GI symptoms can be another symptom of the COVID-19 infection. So what do you do if you have these symptoms? If you're not super sick with it, and I hope you're not, and most people aren't, most people aren't, then self-quarantine, stay at home, Become a fan of daytime television because you're going to be sitting there drinking warm tea and having some Tylenol or ibuprofen for your aches and pains and drink plenty of fluids. Just take it easy at home, much as we do with the flu. If you're short of breath and you have a high fever and you're really sick, then you should call in. Don't necessarily go in, but call in. Call to your primary care office. Call the emergency room. Um, a lot of, of healthcare companies have these um, sort of on-call nurses that will talk you through it. And they have good protocols for how to respond to that. I think the wrong thing to do, unless you're really super sick, and then you'd need to go tr get transported to the emergency room. But otherwise, don't go to the emergency room. Why? Because there's a lot of coronavirus that could conceivably be in the emergency room because they're busy treating people that are really sick with it and because you don't need to add to the problem. So call and get some advice. So what sort of things can you do to help with the symptoms of coronavirus if you have that? And it's very similar to that with which you'd treat a, a flu. Drinking some warm tea, having a spoonful of honey, you know, that, that's a good cough medicine. Stay away from a lot of the over-the-counter medicines, which really sounds good, but they're a whole mixture of medicines. They have Tylenol in them, they have decongestants, which can cause side effects, they have cough suppressants, which can cause side effects. So, and which one of those is causing your side effects, you don't really know, because they're all mixed into the one. So if you have a cough, you know, I think a spoonful of honey works well. I like those little honey lemon uh, cough drops. Those work well. They're soothing to the throat. Um, a cough medicine called Delsim, D-E-L-S-Y-M, which you can get in generic so it doesn't cost quite as much, is a pretty good cough suppressant because cough is an uncomfortable part of it. And then, of course, be aware, if you get short of breath, this is a viral pneumonia. Coronavirus or COVID-19 is a viral pneumonia. And so if you're having problems breathing, that's the big complication. That's what people die of with this COVID-19 infection. So then you'd want to seek help. 
So how long does it take to get this virus? All right, the, the incubation period, in other words, the time from exposure until you've developed symptoms is on average 5.2 days. So it takes a little while to get it. Once you get the symptoms, then you might have a mild case, you might have a severe case. And so how long it actually lasts is very variable based on the individual. Um, the, usually the recommendation is if you've been exposed to someone with COVID-19, then you want to self-quarantine for 14 days monitoring yourself. What was self-quarantine, self-monitoring, what does that mean? That means take your temperature a couple of times a day, be aware of your symptoms, but don't get real worried about them, but monitor, and if it doesn't seem like things are going in the right direction, then call, call for help, call on the phone. Um, otherwise, you want to stay isolated if you have symptoms until 72 hours after the symptoms have resolved. So, oh, I'm feeling better today. Well, great, that's good. I don't have a fever today, that's good too, but you don't go to work tomorrow. That's the time when you'd start the countdown. For, so three days later, you could then go ahead and report back in and go back to work. The coronavirus is real variable in the severity of illness that it causes. And it can cause no symptoms, and those people are still infectious. That's a little scary, and they're still working out quite how that works. You can have mild symptoms, or you can have severe symptoms. The people that tend to die from COVID-19 are typically elderly, infirm people with underlying lung disease. It's rare for it to cause severe illness or death in younger people. And if you look at the, the curve for the death rate versus age, then it goes up exponentially as one gets older. Typically, and there are people that are in the 30s to 50s that die from it. We've had one in Wisconsin who was in his 50s and died from this disease. That's fortunately unusual. So the, the odds are, say there's about a, a 1% death rate in people that are in their 50s, but that means one person out of 100 dies, so it does happen. But when you get up to people that are over 80, it can be nine or 10 per 100 that die from it. So what about a vaccine? We all know that there are a lot of viral illnesses you can vaccinate against. Influenza is a good example of that. Everybody gets their flu shot every year, and so that's a that's a possibility, and, and it's, a lot of efforts are being made through a number of laboratories around the country to develop a coronavirus vaccine. In order for a vaccine to be optimal, it needs to be safe. You know, you don't want to get super sick from having the vaccine. It needs to be effective. In other words, it has to prevent the infection. And it's hard for, I think, for the researchers to put that all together. So that typically is a time-consuming process, even though it's a maximal effort anywhere from six to 18 months for the development of a vaccine. So we're, we're on our own a little bit for a while until the vaccine comes out. So if we don't have a great vaccine and it's really contagious, then what do we do? The thing to do is practice social distancing. And because it's spread by droplet, when someone coughs or, coughs or sneeze uh, or speaks, you know, and you have a little bit of spit coming out of your mouth when you speak, not to be too graphic, but nonetheless, that's how it's transmitted. So six feet away from each other. My son, who's a great guy, a PhD engineer out in California, now practicing his uh, stay at home, has, has coined a term which I think is worthwhile sharing. Six feet around is his coronasphere. So if someone's in your coronasphere, just politely tell them, please, you're in my coronasphere, back up a little bit. Now, I think that's a good way of remembering. It certainly has made me practice social distancing more. The virus is transmitted primarily by droplet. In other words, from speaking and sneezing. That's why you have that six-foot coronasphere around you. But there are other ways you can catch it as well. And they've done some research. recent article in a leading medical journal called the New England Journal of Medicine has shown that the coronavirus can live on surfaces. On cardboard, it can live for 24 hours. On hard surfaces like stainless steel or, you know, granite countertops, that sort of thing, 72 hours. Doorknobs, 72 hours. Now, not real sure how virulent or how contagious the virus is when it's on the surface, but I, I think until we know more, we have to assume that, it's, uh, that it is contagious. That's why the Sani wipes, the Clorox wipes, are so important to use. What do you need to sanitize along those lines to clean it off surfaces? I think using a Santa wipe or a Clorox wipe, or if you, know, if you can't find that stuff at the store because it's all sold out, you can get a roll of paper towels, you can get some household bleach, you make a dilute bleach solution, and you can look online to see what a dilute bleach solution is, but it's basically household bleach that's diluted so that it doesn't ruin your clothes. And just 
dampen a paper towel and use that. And that works very well for cleaning off surfaces. But it's important for you to clean off surfaces. What surfaces should you focus on? Well, all of them, but that's not practical. So doorknobs, um, remotes, they're, those are germ magnets. You know, they, they did a study once, what's the, what's the most germ-laden thing in a motel room? It's the remote. So wipe that off. Um, your mouse and your, your keyboard, and we all work on those all the time, so wipe them off real good. Uh, here at the base, we're advocating that every workstation cleans up after themselves by using the Santa wipes that we have here, or the Clorox wipes, after each shift and at the beginning of each shift. So there might be some double cleaning, but that's okay. You know, let's be extra careful. So what other steps can you take to prevent coronavirus? Personal hygiene is real important, and that's where hand washing. See, my hands are all kind of red and chapped because I'm washing them so often. So it's so important, I think, don't shake hands with people. The elbow bump works, you know. You can do a foot bump, too, if you'd like, but that's a little harder. And wash your hands frequently. That's important. The, the Purell or the hand sanitizer is good, so long as it's more than 60% alcohol. So read the label. If you pick up some and all the, all the hand sanitizer is gone on the shelf except for this one, it's probably because it's less than 60% alcohol. It has to have that to kill the virus. And there's nothing wrong with just soap and water. And the way you do soap and water is you, you lather up your hands and you, you wash them for 20 seconds. There are a couple of ways you can time that. You can count to 20 seconds if you'd like. Um, here on base, usually by the time the water gets warm, that's 20 seconds. Um, also, sing happy birthday twice, that's 20 seconds. You can sing God save the queen twice, that's 20 seconds if you're so inclined to do that. But uh, I like in Agata De Vida, so if I do a couple of verses of, of Iron Butterfly, then I have 20 seconds. Also, be careful where you put your hands that you've carefully washed. If you put them on your face, if you rub your nose, if you rub your eyes, and we do that all hundreds of times a day, that's really a hard habit to break. Don't do that because that's putting the virus where it gets in. Where does it get into our body? It doesn't soak through the skin. It goes in through the respiratory tract. It's a respiratory illness, so it's like a cold. So you breathe it in. Uh, even in your mouth, not so much because there are salivary juices in there that kill the viruses. So really your nose and your eyes, that's a direct pathway to your respiratory tract. So keep your hands away from your face. So how does the virus get in you? Well, as, as we mentioned, through your eyes, through your nose, then it gets into your respiratory tract. It's not in your mouth so much. It's not a GI thing so much, although it can be, it, you know, it affects every cell of your body, but it has its, its uh, virulence, its, its danger in your respiratory tract. It causes a viral pneumonia. So how do we keep us safe on base? And I think we have a responsibility to quarantine the base, to have us as a safe zone. How do, we, how do we keep the base safe? So a couple of measures. Before you leave home, uh, ask yourself these questions. And if you don't remember the questions after I uh, tell them to you, remind you of them, then you can go on the app and, uh, and click on the uh, access to base button and, um, and then answer those questions. What are the questions? First, do you have a cough or shortness of breath. Secondly, do you have a fever? Is your temp above 100.4? But really, any fever. Third, have you been exposed to someone that has known or suspected COVID-19 illness? If any of those three questions are affirmative, don't come to base. Call your supervisor. So, a message for the community. If you see guardsmen come in and they're probably in uniform, they may have a gas mask on. And you think, oh my gosh, what's going on there? Folks, you've probably heard that there's a shortage of protective, personal protective equipment, or so-called PPE, around the country. And there's a huge ramp up around the country to try and make more of the N95 mask. The N95 mask is the one that is, uh, helps very much prevent infection. And it's adequate protection from coronavirus, keeping it from entering your respiratory tract through your nose, through inhalation. Also, there might be people wearing gowns. Uh, gowns are used more commonly in the hospital than they are out in the community. Gloves, gloves are of, of certainly some um, protection because they keep it off your hands. You have to be careful you take the glove off properly. And I think they're just washing the hands is the main thing. But what if you see some military person coming down the street with a gas mask on? Should you worry? No. They're not using up an N95 mask, of which there's a shortage. They're using a mask that's specifically and reusably 
prescribed for them. They've been specifically fitted to this mask. So they're, they're using resources that, that aren't disposable. That's the reason for wearing the gas mask. So we need to pace ourselves. We could be in this for the long haul. Nobody knows how long this is going to be. Nobody knows how long our, our civil liberties, you know, self-imposed, I hope, but also directed by the governor, are going to be imposed upon us. But we want to try and, and limit the spread of infection so we can recover from this as quickly as possible. The National Guard's there to help. If you see some guardsmen out there, they're not, they're not there to impose their will upon you. They're there to help you. So be supportive of them. They'll be supportive of you. How do you find more information about the COVID-19 infection? I tell you, listen to the news. There, there often is some good information. They have expert speakers that, that come on the news. So stay informed. Read the newspaper. CDC.gov is an excellent website. Browse through that. It has more information than you'd ever want to know. But if there's a question, and there's, often, there's a frequently asked questions uh, section in the CDC.gov website, then that's an excellent resource as well. Google COVID-19. Don't believe everything you read on the internet. If it really should be a reliable source, a reliable website like cdc.gov, but educate yourself about it. I think knowledge is power when it comes to something like this. And, and the book is being rewritten every day on COVID-19. So we're all learning about it, but keep yourself educated. Don't rely on rumors. Don't let someone sell you something on the telephone. There are people that take advantage of the situation, but educate yourself. And a slide we're going to show next will show some reliable resources that may be of help for you. Thank you.